the year was 1978. The occasion was a Sunday school class of about 120 high schoolers. An invitation was given because for 15 weeks of a study in 1 Corinthians, we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and the invitation was for them to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Forty teenagers responded to that invitation just like I am praying that you will respond today. Whenever the Word of God is shared, an invitation is given to all of us, whether in personal devotions, Bible study, Sunday school class, doesn't matter, church, whether those facilitating are giving invitation or not, it doesn't matter. God is always inviting us to respond, always. That happened to be a public invitation, though, and the teenagers came forward, and what began then, years later, 30 countries, a million people touched, impacted in various ways, and I'm thankful that that same scripture verse is still motivating people even today. Your students, by the way, are precious. Really precious. I could see them impacting our world. They are really precious. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Steve, for trusting me. Would you turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58? The Bible encourages us to be steadfast, unmovable, always, depending upon your translation, abounding in the work of the Lord, possibly fully involved in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. The Greek word there is be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, above and beyond in the work of the Lord. And it's not occasionally, it's always, always above and beyond in the work of the Lord. Now the work of the Lord is in two, as described in Scripture, in two ways. Our, say like our occupation, no, God forbid. The word occupation is what we occupy. No, God has each and every single one of us at our vocation as a ministry. Your heart, your passions, your skill set. I mean, you grew up with all this this stuff and you just were passionate about it and all of a sudden you, you found your niche and, and you get a paycheck <laughs> to be a full-time servant of the Lord right there at that job. It's not an occupation that you occupy. It's a vocation. It, it, it's, it's God's calling for you. But the second way the work of the Lord is described in Scripture is that that that, that anointing by God where he, he has us sharing Scripture with our friends to see the reality of Christ in us live and in person and some of us have a chance to just kind of yield to that full-time vocation and it's always to share the Lord. Here is um, possibly the difference. When my sons and interns decided to end their, their summer stint with us, they decided to go skydiving. Dad, you want to come with us? No. <laughs> I drew the line in the sand. But I had to go. I mean, it was kind of, you know, dad, intern, son, I, could you see what the newspapers would do with that? Oh, boy, if there's ever an accident. I went. And I was impressed. 
really impressed with all the preparation, the training, the, 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 the equipment, the, the straps, the harnesses, and then with all the, all, the, all the training came somebody behind them that they strapped, a professional who's been doing this for a long time. And, and I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm a part of all of it, and I'm thinking, I want to go. <laughs> I really wanted to. They um, wouldn't let me. <clears throat> Got to have money. I didn't have the money. The joy that they had when they returned, the joy that I saw on their GoPros was huge. Every single one of them had a story to tell and an excitement, uh, an initial fear as they took that step of faith right out into the air. And when gravity started to hurl them to the earth, it was scary that turned into elation every one of them couldn't wait to go again and i loved it seeing their expression their joy i loved seeing their joy but something far more joy filled and passionate is being a paratrooper he skydives too, but his is on mission. He's doing it to rescue somebody. And a lot of us take our, our joys at the workplace, and, and we do get so much out of it. We can come home and talk to our, our spouses forever, and it is wonderful. But if it's not on mission, if we're not there to rescue people, if... if, if if it, it is merely our elation that we get out of it, it's not as much as you could get out of it. And the invitation today is for every single one of us to come to the place where we're willing to be always above and beyond in the work of the Lord. Now, the scripture begins with be steadfast. I love this scripture, and I'll tell you why. It has the nuance of, of a foundation. Be firm, um, be, so, be constant, but it has this essence to that word that means in the midst of an ambush. And so wow, when the Spirit of God took that quill in Paul's hand and, and made sure that was the word that was, that was used in that scripture, that's because the Spirit of God knew that Satan, as a roaring lion, seeks who he may devour. The Spirit of God knew that Satan came to steal, kill, and destroy. And what he can't steal, he'll kill. What he can't kill, he'll destroy. Everything of value in every single one of us. There is an ambush. It's not like a happenstance, a tornado when they're trying to crush our foundations. So we got to, no, 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 no. This is a strategic, well thought through ambush by the diablos of your soul. And the Lord is asking each and every one of us to be steadfast. Unmovable, which you cannot be removed. It's almost two negatives there, isn't it? Cannot and then removed. But I'm telling you, that's it. For us to come to the place where, okay, Lord. It's a package deal. If I cannot be steadfast, I'll never be able to be unmovable. And if I'm not steadfast and unmovable, I cannot always be abounding above and beyond in the work of the Lord. So I might as well start with you Lord and just let you do it in me so the question arises why now there's a lot a lot a lot a lot of reasons why the Lord gives us as to why we should humble ourselves and submit to this wonderful scripture verse but let me just give us two 
In John chapter 10, verse 10, it's Jesus speaking, and he says, the thief comes, referring to the devil, Satan. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And that little nuance there is he can't do anything but steal, kill, and destroy. The little Greek nuance there is there's no wiggle room. He doesn't just show up some days a little tired and not give us a hard time. No, 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 no. He is on call. His passion, his only, only thing is to destroy you. And how does he get to the Father? You get to the children. You want to destroy each of you adults here today? You just have somebody come alongside and abduct your child, your grandchild. And as hard as it is on them, it destroys you. And what is it that Satan is out to destroy, to steal, kill, and destroy? It is every single one of us. He can't not do those things. But Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it above and beyond. Same Greek word. <sighs> okay. So why should I be steadfast and movable, always abounding? Number one, the life that he gives. The life that he gives. <clears throat> There's two Greek words for life. Bios, from which we give, get biography. That is your day-to-day -day, um, events. Um, your year-by-year -year events. Your life. And they, they put it in a movie and, yahoo, everybody sees it at the end of life. Well, maybe your kids. That is your biography. Just the recorded events. But this is a different Greek word. When Jesus came to give us life, it's not bios, it is zoe. He came to give us the very essence of who he is. He came to breathe into every single one of us. With the reality of Jesus Christ as our Savior, the Holy Spirit comes in. And with the Holy Spirit is this new life. It is, it is, um, untamable. It's the word wild. And, and, and no, 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 really, that's really what it is. It's the word that is not the day-to-day. -day. It is the, the thing that drives you, the thing that you can't wait to do. I mean, when your wife says, honey, will you do the dishes? Oh, honey, I can't, I've been waiting for you. No, <laughs> no. Okay, we will, we'll do it with joy sometimes for our wife. We'll do that. But what is it that just impassionately makes you wild, where you're untamable? That is Zoe. When the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and he can't do anything, up, Jesus has come to give us his life in us and through us that is untamable. It's wild. It is wild. And he's the life. It's him, the person. He tells us in John 14, 6, that I am the way, the truth, and the zoe. I am. He is. But there is another little Greek nuance there. It's a part of speech that is subjunctive. In other words, it means a choice has to be made. Jesus is the life, and he's going to do it. But oh boy, if we let him, it's, it's the big if. He's got all the capabilities. And the invitation is, Lord, I want to give you permission. You are worth it.
the night before Joe Theismann was blindsided by Lawrence Taylor, which ended his NFL quarterback career with the Washington Redskins. That was a night that was scary beyond belief for a karate and gymnastics team that your youth director was on. Standing outside the door of their chapel presentation, I was there to just kind of greet Redskins as they came in, and Joe Theismann walked by, and he stopped. He backed up, and he looked, and he goes, he saw the bricks and boards all stacked up in, in that hotel room. And he says, breaking for Jesus? I didn't know how to respond. I didn't. Uh, and, and quite thought of it that way. But he immediately said, this I got to see. So I went up to his hotel room, and he got the young lady, that, that Kathy Lee Crosby, that, who at uh, that time was co-host of That's Incredible, and they came back, and he sat in the very front row. My wife sat in the back row. My wife sat in the back row because church youth group in front of the Washington Redskins. And Steve began to share his testimony. She was sitting next to Daryl Green, fastest man in the NFL at one time, and another gentleman, can't remember his name. But she turned to the left, she turned to the right, she says, isn't this ridiculous? I know, rinky-dink for you Redskins. And Daryl Green said, that man is just as passionate about his football as I am, but there's something different about that man. He was a teenager 15, 16 years of age. And Daryl Green said, there's something different about that man. And he shared his whole testimony. Others shared their testimonies. Yes, the bricks were broken, the weights were lifted. Mrs. Head coach, Mrs. Joe Gibbs, came up to me afterwards and said, this is the first chapel Redskins got saved. And there were five or six. Now, it was, it was teenagers who said, okay, Lord, I, I don't know how to do it, I, I, but if you are the life, it, it, Lord, if, if you can bring out the wilds, if what you have planned for me is so much far greater than anything I could ever imagine, then, Lord, you want me steadfast? Okay, I'll, okay. You want me unmovable? Okay. You want me to always be above and beyond even when these things happen? Okay, Lord, I'll just go. And it was that willingness that changed the lives of people. Joe Theismann in the front row even rebuked Kathy Lee. She being co host of That's Incredible at the time. She used to see all that type of stuff, you know, people laying on beds and nails and stuff all the time. But she was crying. Because there's a different emphasis with these teenagers. The emphasis was on Jesus Christ going to the cross, shedding his blood. And life that could be so far beyond anything Kathy Lee had ever seen and experienced. She was crying. Joe turns to her and he says, what you crying for? Mark Mosley and his wife were praying. By the time it ended and he rushed her out the back, he was crying too. He didn't get saved that night. And we know what happened the very next Monday night. But God uses all things. He planted the seed with this man. He spoke at Liberty University this last year, shared his testimony. Jesus Christ has saved that man. Jesus Christ has changed his life. And one of the seeds or one of the waterings was above me on youth ministry. The life that is so, so untamable, that is Jesus Christ himself living in us, living through us. 
is one of the reasons why I want to be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the word of the Lord. But there's another. Please turn in your Bibles. Please do turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. In Ephesians 2, um, verse 10, we've just um, finished an incredible uh, um, impacting reasoning, God helping the church at Ephesus understand that we are saved by grace. And it's not by ourselves. God's, God just grace it. We don't deserve this wonderful love, this sacrifice that was made on the cross. We don't deserve any of this. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. And so after sharing all of this information, he says, we are to be saved by the grace of Jesus Christ alone. And then he goes right into the very next verse and he says, but we are his workmanship. Some translate, we are his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Why? Well, this, this thing of works again. It just keeps kind of coming up. To do good works that God has preordained that we should walk in them. So he really has something already planned for us, and it's because he's created us as his poema. It's the English word that we know as poem. Every single one of us here who come to know Christ as their Savior, he has created you out of nothing. It's all oh, that, that word create is, is, is huge. But he's created out of nothing the specialness, the uniqueness that we have all come to know as you. You are his poem, simply called poetic expression, because a poem left to itself, oh man, I forget the name. Some of you might know. Who's the, the, the young girl who was kind of a recluse, and she wrote 1,400 poems, and she put them in her sock drawer, and it wasn't until after she was dead. They're cleaning out her place, and all of a sudden, look at these poems. Wow. Anybody remember her name? Who? Uh, no, I don't think it was Emily, but, but, but it's famous. Okay. Somebody like Emily. Can you imagine having all these poems? Your life is an incredible, incredible expression of God himself. His masterpiece. His thumbprint uniquely on you. And you just all put it in a sock drawer? Never to be read? No. This wonderful grace that he's given us and allowing us to have a wonderful relation with Jesus Christ so that you would know you've been created as his masterpiece, his poetic expression that needs to be heard and seen by everyone. Let me ask you, really, listen to me. Your poem needs to be heard. Your song needs to be sung. Your, your painting needs to be displayed. Your athletic skills need to be expressed. And whatever it is that God has just created you to be, listen, you are his workmanship, his poetic expression, to do an incredible good work, an incredible good work, which God pre ordained that you should walk in it. Wow. So why should I be steadfast and immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord? Because he is the life that's wild. And because he made me something special. He made you uniquely special. And this world need you. Not in a sock drawer. This world needs you. You see, we can't fail. Andrew Murray said he requires, God requires nothing more of us than what he's prepared for us to do in his Holy Spirit. You can't fail. Remember the movie, The Rookie? Great movie. Oh, it's a great movie. When the 
I can't think of the main actor's name, but he he's, goes to see his dad. Like, Dad, should I, should I try out for Major Baseball? My age, you know, my arm years ago, what happened? And, and his dad said, mm. his dad said, it's okay to think about what you want to do until it's time to start doing what you were meant to do. Ludwig von Beethoven said, I write. I, I've never thought of writing for reputation and honor. What I have in my heart must come out. That is the reason why I compose. What I have in my heart just must come out. And I love it with teenagers because they're exploring and, and you know, the whole world is before them, but I was so loving it. Yesterday, Cat was playing Beethoven over here, and, and, and I loved it, Cat. And, and Joseph and Alex and, and Eric were doing balances up here. It was hilarious, but it's so fun when teenagers begin to explore. Can you, you remember the first time you picked up a guitar? So maybe you never did get it as good as Nathan. Uh, or Pastor Steve, but you know what? You tried, and you realize, oop, this is not my poem, is it? Okay, <laughs> enough people kind of, <laughs> don't do that one. But what is your poem? Let it out. And why can we be steadfast, unmovable, always? I'll tell you why. You are so uniquely, wonderfully, incredibly created by God for a mission that he already has, has planned out for you. And all you have to do is give him permission. But you got to decide. you got to choose. But it's safe. It's okay. If he brings it, he'll bring us through it. It's okay. So how? How? I'd like you to turn to one more scripture verse. I'll read a couple more, but I'd like you to turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. And while you're turning, would you listen to two other scriptures while you're turning to Philippians 2, 13. Can, have you ever been discouraged with the Christian life? I have. And I'll tell you why. It was years ago when I began to realize from Galatians chapter 3, verse 3, it was just like the Holy Spirit was speaking right to me. Are you so foolish having begun in the Spirit? Are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Oh, man. That were the churches at, 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 in Galatia. Why do we have this incredible discourse in chapters 5 and 6 about being so led of the Spirit and having the fruits of the Spirit? And, and it's because... The churches had gotten off course. Isn't it possible today that we can get off course? Is it possible that even though we're infused with the Spirit of God, sealed with the Spirit of God, wow, so many wonderful things with the Spirit of God, time does not permit today. Steve's got me on a leash. But when all of a sudden we get saved by that wonderful work of the Holy Spirit, when we acknowledge that Jesus Christ really is all he said he was, and we compare who he is with our sinfulness, and we finally say, okay, Lord, I I want to be saved. That moment takes place by faith. The only thing we bring to our salvation experience is our sinfulness. That's the only thing we can offer. It's not our church attendance. It's not all the things we've done. The only thing we can bring to Jesus is our sinfulness. Here I am. Take me. And he does.
We're only saved by His grace. And we only live by that same grace. You provided nothing for this wonderful salvation. You provide nothing for your wonderful walk in sanctification. It's His grace that does it all before and after. Now before I read this scripture, all the commands in scripture, and there's lots of commands, do this, do this, do this, love one another. Be hospital towards one another. But every command was never intended for you muscling it up, for you gritting your teeth and, well, I know I, okay, I got to do it. Oh, it's, it's, it's all God doing it in you and through you. So this scripture, you're in Philippians 3, 2, 13, but I'm reading 1 Corinthians 15. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. This is the Apostle Paul, just Holy Spirit, making sure he's writing this down. And his grace to me was not without effect. Okay? I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Every single command has the foundation under it that God wants to do in you and through you. Every single command. Colossians, you can write this down, but don't turn, you're going to stay in Philippians 2, 13, but I'm going to read from Colossians 1, where again the Apostle Paul was, was made by God to, to jot, jot this down. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ, complete in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. It's him doing it in us and through us. So wait, 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 wait. So how do I live this above and beyond life? How do I come to a place where I really, even though the, the ambush is going to take place, and I finally decide because it's a choice to be steadfast. And so how do I get to the place where I am unmovable? And what is it that has to take place for me to be always above and beyond in the work of the Lord? Here it is. God working in you and through you. The Christian life is impossible there's only one person who's ever done it, Jesus, and he wants to continue through his spirit to do it through you. He never intended you to live the Christian life. Never. The life that's him, the wild side, the true essence of who God is, it's him. I am the way, the truth. I am the life. And God made sure, Paul wrote this down, I strenuously contend with all that I do with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. It's Christ alone. Now, here in Philippians 2.13, for it is God who works in you. It is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. It's God who works in you to affect your will and the actual assignment. Have you ever been honest with God and said, God, you've given me this assignment to speak to my coworker. God, you've given me this assignment. The other mom on the playground, the kids on the swings, and Lord, we've been doing this for a long Lord, I've never shared with her. Lord, 
And I know, Lord, I got to be honest. Would you change my will? Do a work on my will because right now I don't want to. And you wait to see what God does. That's it. That's the permission. That, that is it. When you and I come to the place, okay, Lord, I can't, you can. I don't want to, and you can even change my will. And guess what? God shows up. He promised. And didn't Joshua say, when he's about to go the way of all the earth, about to die, there's not one good promise that the Lord your God has given you that hasn't been fulfilled? Not one? Doesn't, doesn't 1 Thessalonians say God is faithful? He who's called you is faithful who also will do it? Okay, Lord, I don't want to love my coworker. I don't want to forgive that offending party but I'll let you change me. Rick had been divorced for three years, and this is really important. His wife had turned to a lawyer, and he had given up hope. But he came to a place where he had a decision to make, a choice, just like all of us, Will I let the Lord take over? And I'm, I'm, I have to give him permission. Look, step back and move on. Lord, I'm a mess. And he humbled himself. And God did such a work in him. When he'd pick up the kids, she'd notice. God did such a work. When she was late with the kids, she noticed. God was doing such a work. When her flat tire, he went, she noticed. The list goes on all the time she had offended him, hurt him intentionally. But he let God do it. It was five years of letting the Lord do the wonderful work in him, and all of a sudden she was seeing this incredible work. And she finally married him. Again, second time. They do seminars now around the country. You know what, everybody? When one person makes a decision to let God be God, he, she, a teenager, can really be used of the Lord. But let me ask you this, and I mean this. What would happen if the entire church did it? What would happen if the entire church, everybody, okay, Lord, I'll surrender. Yeah, I'll surrender. I'll be like those 40 teenagers 40 years ago. And Lord, I'll, uh, count me in. I, I want to be stuff as someone who's always about in the work of the Lord. But I give you permission to do in me and through me. You are worth it. You made me as I am. Lord, I surrender to you. If this whole church did it, we'd have to go to three, four, and five services. And when Lon Solomon made that prayer and McLean Bible Church went over... Half the church left. Half the church left. Real dilemma. God, you called me to this, but Lord, this is not what I... The ambush, oh boy. But Lon said, Lord, I'll surrender to you. I give you the permission to do anything you want to do. He preaches six, seven, eight ser services now on Sunday. Getting ready to retire like the 17th largest church in our nation, it's just across the river, McLean Bible Church. When everything, when all hell broke loose, guess what? He surrendered. Don't wait for the ambush. Don't wait. Right now as individuals, yes, Lord, I surrender. I give you permission but also, think about the entire youth group, the entire men's group, all the ladies. 
I can't imagine what you senior citizens infused with the Spirit of God and with all the different poetic expressions he's gotten, every single one, I can't imagine what this community would look like with you in retirement, what, with all this time on here, but now, not just skydiving, ah, uh, now I'm paratrooping. I'm on a mission. Would you bow your heads with me, close your eyes, I'd like to pray. Heavenly Father, you, Lord, are just so incredible. Lord, we can't even begin to understand the awesomeness of you, but you gave us Jesus. And Jesus is, if we've seen Jesus, we've seen you, and Lord, he is so far beyond what we can even imagine. And so we're coming to all of you, Holy Spirit, you're doing a work right now in all of us. And, and so, Lord, we want to give you permission. Lord, some of us here today are legitimately scared. We've been hiding our poems in a sock drawer. And, Lord... It's time for the sock door to be opened. Lord, I've been too scared. I have so much baggage. But Lord, if you will do this work in me and through me and change my want to, then Lord, I give you permission today. And if that's your heartbeat, would you simply stand to your feet right now? And all over the church, if you are just giving him permission, just stand and say, Lord, I want to be steadfast, unmovable, always above and beyond in your heart. Go ahead, stand right now. Yes, 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 yes. Heavenly Father, there are so many emotions going through our hearts and our minds right now, but it's you who promised to do it. And so, Lord, we're committing ourselves to you. Lord, each of us have this most incredible poem, and Lord, you gave it to us. And so, Lord, with your life that's just given us so much, we want to just surrender and we give you permission permission and now with every head bowed and everybody still praying pray for yourself right now pray for your neighbors pray for the church I'd like one other small invitation but this is so important if you would like Jesus if you'd like to know this Jesus personally you can know him today. There's a thing called repentance. It's changing your mind about your sin and the Savior. It's just you know where you've been. You know what you've done. You know what you've said. You know what you have been thinking. And if you would realize today that there's more, there's him if, if, you, if you've come to the place, you've changed your mind about your son and Savior, then I'm asking you to, by faith, pray with me right now to believe. Pray with me right now. Pray this. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Lord, my sin, my past, I give you my hand habits Lord I'm asking you to do the type of work in me that I've heard this morning save me change me and I pray this from the bottom of my heart if that was your prayer today I would love our prayer team just to join me right up here. Would you just simply raise your hand?
any place, all the way, so I, so I can see you, so I can meet you personally. Anybody, anybody, anybody? Okay. Know that the prayer team is here for you. And even though I'm dismissing a church service, they are here for you. I am here for you. Pastor Steve is here. Pastor Steve on the too. Um, youth director Steve. We got we got so many that are here for you. So even though I'm closing, we're up here for you. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you. Jesus. From the bottom of our heart, we thank you. In your name.